I met Pamela up in, um, uh, in D.C. Uh, in the Office of Science and Technology where she was the lead, the national stock assessment coordinator. And uh, what was interesting to me about rereading Pamela's CV is she's one of the few people I know that not only has been in academia but has been at three government agencies, um, at DFO Canada, at now her position as chief scientist for the fisheries ministry of New Zealand, and also at NOAA Fisheries in uh, both the Northeast and at headquarters. So she brings a really interesting perspective to, um, to us because she has that broad perspective of more than one government agency, which I don't know if you, I, many people don't have that. What Pamela knows, there's bureaucracies everywhere. But I think there's some interesting um, details. And I also think she's going to be able to talk to us about something interesting today, which is um, on just before she heads off to Qatar for the uh, CITES conference there, uh, starting on the 13th, uh, which only happens every three years. And so I suspect you'll see some of the results of that conference in the news. And I think what some of what Pamela will talk to you about today will that in perspective. But, um, and, and Julia mentioned, I, I ought to mention, not only did Pamela have all that experience, but was actually in uh, Julia's office um, fixing her own shoe with a hammer just moments before. <laughs> <laughs> so that was pretty impressive. So I just want to introduce my friend Pamela Mace and her talk, Defining Endangered Under the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of, and I did know this, Wild Fauna and Thank you, guys. I think my microphone is working. Hey, thanks very much for the introduction, Liz. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, CITES and the listing criteria and what's happening at the CITES meeting. I should start, though, by saying that um, what I mean by marine species, I'm not including absolutely all marine species here. I'm mostly focusing on what you might call um, medium and large scale commercially exploited marine species, not the sort of intrinsically rare abyssal plain species or and not even marine mammals. And I'll be doing some comparisons with terrestrial, and there I'm kind of excluding the insects. So really talking about the, the, the ones that we exploit for commercial, uh, for, sorry, for human purposes. Here's just a little overview of what, um, what I'm going to talk about. Just very briefly, what is CITES? And I realise that some people in the room here will have a lot of ex some experience or even a lot of experience with CITES. And others won't even know what the acronym means, although it was on my title slide. Um, Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species of Fauna and Flora. Um, talk about the uh, criteria for listing species under CITES um, that exist, which are based on IUCN, um, World Conservation Union, as it's now called, uh, listing criteria. What issues I have with the criteria, I'll talk a little bit about the difference between a, a fish species or a fish species being overexploited versus endangered. Um, is there a difference? Uh, do a quick evaluation of the, the new criteria that were just adopted three years ago and are actually being used, fully used for the first time this year because, um, as Liz said, I think the uh, meetings are only once every three years. Upcoming issues at, at this um, 15th <coughs> meeting of the Conference of the Parties and Societies, and I'm just going to talk about um, two of the issues. There's many, many issues, 63 I think agenda items, which I'm sure you don't want me to go through. Um, and then a bluefin tuna and spiny dogfish, and then I'll try and get back to my original question of are marine species actually special? Okay, what is CITES? Oh, I hope there's something else I was going to say. All right, I just wanted to mention that, um, you know, some, some of the things, um, based on past experience, we start talking about endangered species and whether species should be listed or not it can actually get to be quite controversial for people who are involved in the field. 
And so I probably prefer not to get into some intense discussions during my talk. I'm more than happy to afterwards. So I think I'd, I'd sort of prefer to just go through and if people want to ask points of clarification, um, you know, if something's not clear and what I say, then please feel free, but, um, but I'd be happy to leave the debate until, until later on. Um, okay, I'll start going back, um, well, it's really only going back about, about three years, um, three to about maybe 12 years ago. Probably about 12, 12 years ago, these um, uh, criteria and guidelines were set up by CITES for. Um, <coughs> sorry, I do need to go back here. Apologies, I haven't actually finished with this slide. What is CITES? CITES prohibits or regulates commercial international trade in fauna and flora species that are endangered or at risk of extinction. Um, it has been enforced for a long time. There's 175 member nations now, which is most of the uh, recognised countries of the world. Came into effect in 1975 and um, was basically the large cats and elephants that, um, that, that started the whole thing, that was the impetus for it. Meets about once every three years and considers listing proposals and a whole lot of implementation issues. And there are two main appendices. Um, appendix one, is for species at risk of extinction, and that is um, that bans pretty much all international trade, certainly all international commercial trade, but um, does um, potentially allow for um, trade in scientific specimens, for example. Then Appendix 2 is um, depleted or endangered species, and these are uh, monitored and regulated international trade and is a requirement for countries doing the exporting to make non-detriment findings. Okay, this is a criteria that, that CITES had been operating into, uh, under, so Appendix 1, International Trade Band, which is mostly what I'm going to talk about. Appendix 2, International Trade Monitored and Regulated, I'm not going to talk about that too much. Um, I don't have too many of these dark coloured background um, slides, but hopefully you can read this one. So the main criteria for an Appendix 1 listing are to do with small wild population, restricted area of distribution, and a declining wild population. Um, and this is the previous criteria. So under a small wild population, the guideline was less than 5,000 for a population, less than 500 um, for subpopulations. And basically, this first one, um, I would say, for most commercially exploited marine species, would be functionally extinct, um, and if not, you know, aiming towards biological extinction. It's basically too low of a standard for most marine species. And then I think um, this one may be okay for some, and this declining wild population, which is a decline of more than 50% in five years or two generations. Oh, this is the, this yellow highlight, and I'm not using this too often. It's whichever is the larger. Um, so 50% in five years or two generations, whichever is the larger. Um, for a small population, more than 20% in 10 years or three generations, whichever is the larger. And this would be overkill for most marine species, especially those that are fairly newly exploited. Um, you know, 20% of, well, let's say 50% um, in five years or two generations, there'd be quite a few commercially exploited species that would qualify on that basis, but they would not be considered to be anything like endangered or at risk of extinction. And this was one of the problems that the fishery scientists in particular, marine scientists had with, had with these criteria. Um, Appendix 2, basically the criteria there are much more woolly um, and they're, they're essentially one of the objectives of an Appendix 2 listing is just to prevent species, bring things under control before they actually become eligible for this, um, meeting these criteria here that would list them on Appendix 1 and ban all international trade. Now, um, there was a process that started, oh my gosh, 12 years ago, I think, um, at least 10 years ago, to revise these criteria and make them more applicable. And at that time, um, new IUCN or World Conservation Union criteria had just come out. 
And um, so we, we use this as a basis um, for the revision, or at least one of the bases. And again, you've got a bit of a problem. I'm, there's three categories I'm going to go through. I'll go through this slide in a little bit of detail, but the reason for this color here is that, uh, again, this is whichever is the larger or the longer um, in terms of time frames. Um, the only thing that will change between the sides is these, like you said, look kind of orange, don't they? Orange numbers. Everything else is the same. So defining critically endangered, endangered, and vulnerable. So a critically endangered population is um, more than 90% um, decline in the past 10 years or three generations, whichever is the larger, if understood, reversible, and stopped. Or 80% decline greater than or equal to in the past 10 years or three generations, whichever is the larger, if it isn't. And then um, same with it can be projected or it can include a projected period or a a recent period plus a projected period. Um, now, I mean, these sorts of criteria would be of concern for marine species, but they may or may not indicate endangered or, or um, at risk of extinction, really depending on the time period that you're talking about, whether it's the whole time period or it's just a, a more recent time period. This, on the other hand, a geographic range with an extent of occurrence of less than 100 square kilometres, area of occupancy less than 10 Square kilometers for commercially exploited marine species. This is gone. You know, this 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 just simply doesn't work. Same with population size of less than 250 mature individuals and continuing decline and so forth. Um, this that they'll be pretty much you know headed towards biological extinction. I think um, at that time and 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 D the same population size less than 50 mature individuals and then. Criterion E is to do with uh, quantitative analysis, essentially population viability analysis. I'm not actually going to talk about that at all in this talk. It's not actually something that's been used at CITES, um, at least not for marine species, and, and not as far as I'm aware for other species too, although I'm not familiar with that, everything that's been done there. Okay, so um, we're moving on to endangered, and then when you look at these criteria for endangered, again, 50% decline in the past 10 years or three generations. Um, well, for marine species, we've got a lot of examples of that, you know, of that time period, and they would definitely not be considered. Well, by most people I know, fishery scientists, they would not be considered to be, very few species would be considered to be endangered unless that comes on top of um, a period when there's already been a lot of exploitation, <coughs> then it might be the case. But not if you're looking over the whole, um, the whole um, history. So vulnerable, just simply the numbers changing here. Again, classifying the species as vulnerable because it's had a 30% decline in three generations, or or grading record to a 30% decline. Um, that would again be quite common for a lot of commercially exploited species. So the um, fishery scientists and um, uh, FAO, the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, felt that these were not really applicable to marine species. In some cases, they were way too low of a standard, in the case of absolute numbers. And in some cases, they were way too high of a standard in terms of um, defined criteria. So, we, in fact, identified these issues with uh, both the CITES listed criteria at that time and the IUCN criteria. Now, the fact that um, neither considered the historical extent of decline at all, they focused on what we call recent rate of decline, but it's decline over this three generations or ten years, whichever is longer. I'm calling that recent rate of decline, although it may not always be recent. We wondered why on earth you would just focus on a time period like that. Why not go back as far as you possibly can, look at the entire history of exploitation of the of the species, and you know, um, we put together quite a few examples as to why that was a good idea. Wonder whether in fact generation times were useful time frames to look back at. Um, whether generic absolute numbers, whether you could define some sort of absolute number that would be applicable across all different taxa, um, and whether in fact you needed different numbers or criteria with different life histories or taxonomic groupings 
And whether, in fact, generic numeric guidelines were useful at all, we kind of felt they were, um, because they do force the issue. And the more quantitative you can be, and we've shown that in the US with um, uh, coming up with quantitative overfishing definitions that actually um, you know, mean that you've got to take action when you're below some pre-specified level. Um, I suggest that historical extent of decline should be the ultimate criterion for considering a species for listing as endangered or at risk of extinction. Um, some people suggest that, and especially terrestrial biologists, they say that such baselines are really quite impossible to estimate. And yet if you ask, is a stock depleted, you would actually um, look back into history. You'd perform some sort of mental gymnastics to compare the current size to the historical size. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, we do have situations where we might need to modify this percent historical level to percent potential because we do have irreversible habitat changes. And it's a bit of a thorny question. You know, to what extent do we, um, do we adjust our expectations um, and just say, oh, we can't, you know, things are irreversible, we just got to live with what we've got. Um, and we end up with a shifting baseline problem, which is something that I'll get into a little bit. I'm actually gonna... Um, I've, I've put together three... Um, this is a hypothetical example where we've got three populations of the same species. Um, they, both start, they both start at the same point and end up at a point that's about 10% of the initial point and over a period of, let's say, 100 years. Um, the question was, you know, which situation is worse? One where there's been a steady decline, one where there's been a historically really rapid decline, and then um, fluctuating around some low level. One where the species has been unexploited and then has suddenly been discovered, let's say, and has experienced a rapid decline. Now, if you, on this one here, if you use the IUCN criteria, and this has a mean generation time of 10 years, um, you went back 33 years, you get the 73% decline. But if you went back the whole history, you get a 90% decline. Why would you go back this arbitrary amount of time? Um, now, B, people might think, oh, that looks pretty safe. You know? <coughs> okay, there was a big decline in the past, but things are all right now, and they've been all right for a long period of time, so it must be okay. And this one here is almost certainly the most dangerous, especially since this doesn't look like it's, well, if you extrapolate, you'll go through the origin. Um, but, um, but it's this one here that would be the most neglected under IUCN criteria. And I'd quite like to hear other people's opinions on this. I kind of have, on the basis of my experience, a view of how species go extinct and how they often go extinct. And, um, you know, maybe even usually. And the problem is we don't track most species down to extinction. Um, there's very few species where I've actually counted all the way to extinction. I'll show you a coming up on this side. So we generally have an unexploited phase and then there'll be some period when it's exploited, some period when either it becomes unprofitable to, to um, exploit that species or maybe the government finally steps in and bans um, exploitation. And I think that the way that most species go extinct is they just teeter around at a low level, and then either someone forgets that, in fact, they're a depleted stock um, and starts exploiting them again, or maybe there's some environmental factor that, um, that chimes in, and, um, and it's something that they might have been able to absorb in the past that they, they can't anymore, and so they just basically head to extinction. Um, and I... <laughs> You know, it wouldn't follow the, quite this trajectory, but I think American passenger pigeons are a bit of an example of this, where, um, you know, people are probably, a lot of people are probably quite familiar with this story, but estimated population size in the early 1800s, 4 billion or, or more. I mean, that's, you know, just one of the estimates I found. Low productivity, even by bird standards, only one egg per season, they didn't seem to look after them very well. Um, they were massively ex exploited for, um, well, pretty much till the 1880s um, into uh, maybe the early 1900s, but it more or less stopped by about the 1890s, I think. 
And when massive human exploitation finally declined, there were still several thousand or tens of thousands of individuals left. But they went, they, they just, they basically um, stopped breeding, you know, so when I actually, um, going back to that previous slide, I mean, that's the other thing that can happen is, you know, down here you've got a Leofax happening, so that's another factor that can come in there. And this looks like for an um, American passenger pigeon, there was a bit of an early effect. They um, were continuing, most states banned hunting, but there was some illegal hunting still going on. But there were still um, several thousand or tens of thousands of individuals left. And they just went pretty much inevitably to extinction. And they appear to have needed, needed large breeding aggregations in order to either the visual or the, some sort of pheromone um, aspect um, of reproduction. They just simply stopped breeding and went to extinction. Now I mentioned um, um, Northern Cod because, um, well, I'll, just, I'll show you these two slides first. I mean, this is from the most recent DFO assessment of 2009. See very high landings, uh, lower period of landings, and then uh, very little, very few landings of recent years. It was a, a sort of a moratorium put in in 1992, although the fishery has been opened for various geo sectors um, ever since. This graph here is the spawning biomass. It's on a different time scale from this, so it's just a recent period. So if you went back in history, you'd be going up quite a bit from here. And basically, the spawning biomass from 92 until very recently has been extremely low, some indication of recovery now. But um, I have heard, it, it is listed under Canadian Endangered Species um, legislation, and I have heard people say that, well, you know, um, they use IUCN criteria, so if it stays at a low level for three generations, then it probably means it's okay and we can, we can delist it. And um, that's another issue I have with the IUCN criteria, I think. That life history traits and so forth have evolved over geological time. And um, I think three generations is probably not enough time when you evolved or adapted to have been a large population to suddenly um, be adapted to be a small population. Um, is generation time an appropriate metric for defining time frames over which to consider the time? I think you already know my answer to that. I think it's not. Um, and the argument, I've had quite um, um, lively debates with people who argue about um, using generation times to look back in history. And they say, well, why wouldn't, you know, for long-lived species, they could exhibit a protracted decline over a long period of time. You should look back, as far back in history as you can for them. And I say, yeah, fine, I agree. But why not look far back into history for um, short-lived <coughs> species as well? And, um, and I think by restricting the time frames, you know, you're, you're, look at, you're essentially getting into a shifting baseline type of situation. So I think this is my last um, hypothetical example, and after this I'll stick to real examples. This is um, um, a salmonid like, or a salmon, sorry, a sardine like species with a mean generation time of three years, two hypothetical populations. Um, you know, lots of fluctuations because it's um, got a short mean generation time. This one here, for whatever reason, goes really high and is coming down steeply. And in this particular example, it's <laughs> declined 54% over the most recent 10 years, which would qualify under IUCN criteria for a listing of at least vulnerable. Um, that's if you don't look back at this. You know, if you only look at your um, three generations or 10 years, you know, be looking at this period and saying, this stops in serious trouble, but it's higher than the average for the whole history of the species. Same with this one here. Um, I think this represents on this graph 39% decline over 16 years. It's not. It's something where you would think it would be better, um, well, something that wouldn't be of concern. And yet, if you were a fishery scientist, for example, you'd look at the whole time series. You wouldn't say this, you know, this is a danger of extinction, but you would say, we better keep a, you know, keep a, an eye on this and, uh, and and see what might happen. Um, is it better to use absolute numbers or um, percent historical to define small populations? <clears throat> so this guideline of 5,000 individuals that was in the old Siles criteria 
Um, we think it's way too low. As I said, they'd be functionally extinct, if not only a way to be being biologically extinct for most commercially exploited species, but probably too high for large whales, actually. Um, but a population of 5,000 of some kind, some of the larger whales, might actually be considered to be reasonably healthy. So maybe um, we might want a number of 1,000 for some large whales or, or 10 million for some small pelagics, and I'll show you some examples of that in a moment. Um, we basically believe, this is FAO and the um, an interagency task force that I chaired when I was working for National Marine Fisheries Service. Uh, this is the only symbol I'm using this talk is, I think, percent B0, just percent of the historical biomass level, or, um, or in fact, percent of some um, appropriate reference point, some appropriate benchmark. And as I mentioned before, I think this one of one of the tenets of using percent historical um, numbers is that is a sort of hypothesis that maybe large populations have adaptations for being large and can't cope with being small. Um, and that's one reason for using this percent decline. I'd really quite like to hear other people's opinions on that. Um, do you need different numbers or criteria for different life histories or taxonomic groups? I won't get into it, but we actually did come up with different numbers for different productivity levels. We felt that high productivity species were more resilient and low productivity species less resilient. But that there are lots of other factors that you couldn't fit into any generic scheme, and we called these modifying factors, and there were two groups, vulnerability factors that at any given level of population size might increase your concern. Um, you know, low absolute numbers, specialised niche requirements, um, existence of disease, and, and so forth. And the main mitigating factor that would decrease concern at a particular percent B0 level for marine species would be high absolute numbers um, or biomass. And marine species do tend to be in quite high numbers, commercially exploited ones. So here was the proposal for um, for change. We um, we felt this was um, an interagency task force and also the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization. Um, generic numeric guidelines is not useful for absolute numbers or area distribution, but are for historical extent of decline. And the primary consideration for this consideration of listing should be historical extent of decline. Homerizing should go as far back in the history as possible when thinking um, maybe we're lucky with marine species, lucky with marine species in the sense that intense exploitation just really goes back about 50 years for most species, not all, um, and certainly not for all coastal species. You can make lots of inferences going further back in history, though, even for terrestrial species, and it ought to be possible to go back at least a couple of hundred years. We, uh, as I mentioned, we thought the um, generic criteria should be dependent on, on um, population productivity with a suggested range um, from the NIMPS task force, because we were including not just fish species, but also terrestrial species. Um, that's a decline down to a level of between 5 and 30% of the unfish level or some other reference level that you think makes sense. Uh, with different parts of the range being appropriate for different taxonomic groups. Uh, FAO, uh, Food and Agriculture Organization, took this and modified it and said for most commercially exploited marine species 5 to 20, that's, that's a um, decline down to a level of, of between 5 and 20% of the unfish level would be more appropriate. If 5% for high productivity, 5 to 10%, sorry, for high productivity, 10 to 15 for medium, and 15 to 20 percent for low, and we define high, medium, and low, and, and on the basis of population parameters. Um, and with generation time being used as potential index of productivity, not a time horizon. Um, and uh, the sort of more recent rate of decline, decline over say a 10-year time period, being more of a criterion for an appendix two listing. So essentially, if the stock is slightly above that which would qualify for an appendix one listing where trade is banned, then um, you know it should be considered for an appendix two listing. And use modifying factors to modify your degree of concern about various species. Um, 
Okay, I was going to talk a little bit, I will try and go through fairly quickly. Um, how do we arrive at these numbers? Well, basically, um, the, for, for most temperate water average productivity species, the biomass associated with maximum sustainable yield, which is a key feature of fishery science, would give you a biomass of around 40% um, of the fish level. Um, I think I'll skip over my next slides and, and, um, on the base, uh, um, for, for the sake of time. But essentially, um, in the US, uh, a stock that's overfished or depleted is defined as um, one that is at half that level. So that would take you down to about 20%. And one that is um, maybe a quarter of that level or 10% be zero would not so much in the US, but in other places would be defined as collapsed. And it would be a point where you might want to try and stop fishing. It still wouldn't necessarily be a point at which you would say that a species is um, critically endangered or vulnerable. So um, overexploited is, would generally be at a higher level um, than what um, endangered or at risk of extinction would be. Okay, so the new CITES criteria and guidelines. Um, they kept this guideline of 5,500, it doesn't work for marine species. De de deleted any um, numeric criteria with respect to area of distribution. Um, I've mentioned that these new ones that were put in for um, declining wild population, but they put the 5 to 30% in the main part of the text, but they have split out marine species as being special. So this, this 5 to 20% range and these different levels of productivity is just in a huge footnote that applies only to marine species and not to other species. Um, and then they kept the rate of decline criteria, but they actually mixed them around. And they put in vulnerability factors, but mitigating factors are only there for marine. So you can't have mitigating factors, apparently, for other species, only for marine. Um, just to summarize the improvements, a um, few changes to the descriptive criteria introduced consideration of historical extent of decline, concept of productivity, which was actually introduced as a surrogate for resilience, specification of historical extent of decline, thresholds, um, less of emphasis on generation time, and the um, more operational approach to Appendix 2 listing, again, only for marine species. Uh, marine species have been separated out quite a bit in the criteria, so marine species we say if it's five to ten percent above these these thresholds, um, then it would qualify for an appendix two listing. If it's um, or if the current rate of decline would lead down to the appendix one criteria within the next ten years. Now, I should mention that um, I'll go back a couple of slides. Um, sorry. Um, when I've talked about these criteria, which are, which are now in the, in the um, CITES guidelines. If you mention these criteria to a fishery scientist, which I did to Ray Hilborn a, um, a couple of days ago, and I said, they said, oh, what are the criteria that are used by CITES? And I said, oh, well, um, 5 to 10% of the unfished level for high productivity species, and his eyebrows went up one notch. And I said, 10 to 15% for medium, and they went up one more notch. And, 15 to 20 percent, um, and if anyone, if any of you have read his recent paper, you'll see that he's actually saying, well, you know, maybe the optimum level at which we should be exploiting species is down to a level of 16 to 25 percent. Um, you know, that, that's sort of having it fluctuating around that level. So when you mention these numbers to fishery scientists, they say, wow, why would you consider a species to be, you know, um, endangered or, over its, or, or um, at risk of extinction in this way. Whereas if you mention it to um, terrestrial biologists or or, um, or some you know marine environmentalists, they say, why would you wait to do something about a species until it gets down? Why would you want to take out 80% or 90% you know of a species? So um, this I'll look at um, a few. Um, example. So are they too liberal? In other words, do they result too many false hits, too many um, 
the species that are not endangered, um, or are they too strict? In other words, would they result in too many false misses? And uh, a key deserving species from Plymouth. And just um, a couple of examples here. California sardine. Um, most people here would know that. Uh, so these lines are recruitment is red, um, blue is biomass, landings is green. And they were fished very heavily in the 30s to the 50s, crashed by about 1964, depending on your definition of crash. Um, over a period of about 20 years, so it was only about 5,000 metric tons, 0.12% of the high level of 4.2 million metric tons. That 0.12% was about 25 million individuals compared to 21 billion when it was, when it was at its peak. Um, from here on, they recovered at the rate of about 35% um, per year, and they're kind of they're around about a million metric tons now. Now, they certainly would have qualified um, uh, 1955 to 1988 or you know thereabouts. Um, were they at risk of extinction? Well, you know, um, they were certainly down at a low level that would even they would be classified as a high productivity species, well below the five percent um, uh, B zero guideline, but there were 25 million individuals. Does that constitute risk of extinction? Yeah. That's why it's really quite hard because they were in fact in more or less one school. And so if you had um, closed the fishery, got rid of the purse saners, already got rid of most of the passiverous whales that used to be in the area, they could have actually, um, you know, been, they, they, they could have gone all the way to extinction. Um, with, given their aggregating behaviour and um, um, if there was a Persane fleet or a pot of whales in the area. Well, they certainly did deserve protection. And as to whether, um, well, the fishery was closed, so you can't really get much more protection than that. And they did come back. And maybe they, uh, they would have um, been better off if they had um, been closed earlier. George's Bank Paddock, um, this stock experienced extremely high recruitment in 1963, which attracted a lot of foreign fishing effort, declined substantially. Um, at its lowest level in 1973, it would have been at 10.8%. This would qualify as a medium productivity species. And um, it, so it would have qualified under, under um, CITES, under Appendix 1. Um, in fact, Another good year class came in here, but it was mostly caught as very small juveniles, and it again plummeted to a really low level, and it's since recovered. Now, you know, would Haddock have, have um, would a CITES listing have helped Haddock to have maybe been a little, on a little bit more of a steady path? Yeah, um, it, it possibly would have. Um, but, it, but basically, you're getting false hits but false misses with these species. And um, I don't really have time to go through these in detail. I've got um, Food and Agriculture Organization did a whole bunch more. Um, these are real examples, but we didn't want to say what they were because we didn't want to be responsible for saying this qualifies for listing, this doesn't. Um, and I can't remember what they were, but um, just a couple of points um, to show from these graphs. Here's a Clupeid um, that went down to 0.013% of its um, um, historical level and it recovered at a quite rapid rate. That's not to mean to say this will always happen. And there are some <coughs> Clupeids where it hasn't actually happened. Here's another one that was at very, very low levels and, and recovered. But these are um, uh, known, you know, for recovering as California Sadi did. And some gathered examples. Um, there are some that most of these would, these ones here would have qualified in the past, but um, but certainly wouldn't now. And this one would qualify if the current trend continued. I think my uh, and this one actually this is an interesting one. This is another one that shows the importance of actually considering the whole time series rather than just um, the recent period. So I think my, my conclusion would be that, um, I mean, this is just a few examples you could, and there are many, many more, but looking at, looking at all the examples for major commercially exploited fish species, um, that 
criteria are too liberal, in other words, they would result in too many species being listed, and you need to bring in the mitigating factor of absolute numbers. That's difficult to do, because as I said for sardines, maybe 25 million wasn't actually a mitigating factor. You know, maybe 25 million doesn't um, mean that you're not going to go extinct, because it was definitely a possibility that that would happen. What's the difference between exploited marine organisms and other and other organisms? And I'll um, just mention a little bit about terrestrial here. So I think the last few slides have shown you that many commercially harvested marine species do have a huge ability to rebound, and that's due to their relatively high productivity. Of course, it's not always the case if they're depleted too severely or if there's habitat loss, but habitat loss is less prevalent for the marine environment than um, certainly than what it is for terrestrial. Um, the people who say that um, maybe, uh, why, why, would you, why would you take out 80% or 90% of a marine species before you considered it to be at risk in any way whatsoever. Um, I came across a compilation by, written in 1995, um, of several hundred references of, of what's happened in terrestrial systems. And um, it's US Geological Survey. And it was mostly focused on the US, but lots of others outside of um, outside the US as well. And basically, I won't read out these numbers, but you, can, you, you go through them. And I, I was actually quite astounded. I mean, I kind of know this, but to see it in writing. Um, any terrestrial system that is as good as 10% of the historical level, you know, I think they're increasingly rare. And there's a lot of, you know, 99% um, loss of primary bird in the US east and deciduous forest, um, you know, more than 90% of natural veg vegetation of Madagascar destroyed and so forth. And for most terrestrial systems, they are, when they talk about, um, well, a 50% decline is really, really bad. What they mean is a 50% decline on top of, you know, what's already happened is really, really bad. So I, I think we've got a little bit of a double standard there. I'll just spend um, a few minutes talking about um, the upcoming CITES conference at the parties meeting. There's going to be a real marine focus this year, marine species focus. There's six proposals for listing. Atlanta Bluefin Tuna on Appendix 1 and spiny dogfish, poor eagle shark, oceanic white tip shark, hammerheads along with dusky and sandbar as lookalike species, and um, corality and paracorality corals. I'm only going to talk about these two, and that's because of some interesting issues that they, um, that they raise. Um, Atlanta bluefin tuna, um, for those of you who don't know, um, there's essentially an eastern, pop, eastern Atlantic population with spawning areas in the Mediterranean, a western one that spawns in the Gulf of Mexico, and they make frequent transatlantic crossings. And there's, there, there are two different, two different stocks, but they mix considerably. And there was once a population off of Brazil that, that people think belonged to the western stock. Um, the issues with bluefin tuna here is catches over time, Mediterranean, East Atlantic, and Western Atlantic. Western Atlantic has been quite low for a long time. Mediterranean and East Atlantic have been quite high in recent years, and this is just the same thing by year time. Here's a series of graphs from the latest stock assessment for Western Atlantic bluefin tuna, and it's just four different um, sets of assumptions for the stock assessment. But basically, no matter which one you look at, it's been severely depleted. There was a rebuilding plan put in place in 1988, but no evidence actually that um, of rebuilding, even though it's actually been implemented quite well, and um, the US has done a really good job of monitoring and enforcing the progress. Here's the situation for the Eastern Atlantic, which is a much bigger, more productive stock. It has not been well um, monitored at all. As people would know, I mean, there's a huge amount of media about this, a huge amount of press at the moment, and has been for the last few years, and um, which is one of the reasons it's been proposed for a listing. 
Here's one sediment of uh, assessment mines. I'm not sure that it's the most ideal, but if you look at spawning stock biomass, um, basically it's been kind of doing okay, and you know some of the model runs are saying that it's looking very bad. Same with numbers, um, um, older individuals, 10 years and older, and fishing mortality has risen um, immensely in recent years. Put it in a, in, a, in a different sort of a context, um, a graph that has biomass um, relative to BMSY and fishing mortality relative to the um, fishing mortality associated with MSY. This is a good, zero, good area, less good, even less good, and really bad. And here's the most recent point. It's about three times the um, optimum fishing mortality of FMSY and about 20% of the optimum biomass. Um, but there are issues. So the science is, is pretty clear, actually. The stock assessments are pretty sh clear that it's in really bad shape. But there are some other issues, and I'll, um, I'll talk about them after I kind of quite briefly go over um, spiny dogfish. Spiny dogfish, this is the main um, concentrations of all mine. Um, there's the proposal suggests that all of the north, northern hemisphere populations are um, severely depleted. Um, the southern ones are okay, but they think they should be listed as lookalikes. They do look alike, because they're the same species. Um, <laughs> which, and this is the first time the lookalike, as far as I'm aware, the lookalike clause has been used to list populations of the same species. Normally it's other species that look like the species that you're trying to protect. There is no doubt at all that they are depleted in the, the, um, the eastern Atlantic. And, um, but, but on the other hand, um, this is one interesting thing about CITES, is that trade between EU countries does not count as international trade. So a big part of the catch here, a big part of the catch here is taken as um, by EU countries. And, and traded within them. So it wouldn't count as international trade. These are really depleted stocks. They've stopped target fishing on them. The EU has banned target fishing. And it's reduced its bycatch quota to 150 tons um, as of last January. Not sure what more they can do. It's the EU that's proposing this listing. So it's like the EU that's the only one that has depleted stocks, um, or the only one that has seriously depleted stocks, let's say. And, um, and it's done something about them, and yet it still wants to list them. And um, um, the proposal suggests that the northwest Atlantic, and is the northeast coast of the US, is depleted. And I'll, I'll just um, show you a couple of slides quickly that suggest that's not the case. Um, I'll put both of these up. Um, this is the situation up to 2007. There was a problem in the past, and there was emergency action put in. Um, this is a, the history, this is the projection, so this follows on from the end of this graph. And it does suggest the stock will go down. Um, this is for different fishing mortality levels, and it's this top one here that is the one that has been adopted. The stock is projected to go down and then increase immensely. And, um, and it has been going up in recent years as well. And why is it going to go down? Well, this is the reason, that, this is the second time it's been proposed for this thing. Here's the reason why um, it's going to go down and the reason why people were concerned in the past is that there is basically a recruitment hole in the series, um, something that seems to be a, quite a feature of quite a few fisheries at the moment. But even re in recent years, recruitment's been increasing and in 2000, the 2009 survey was the fifth highest on record. At the moment, fishermen are complaining um, as they often do about spiny dogfish, that they're a pest and they can't avoid them. Um, one thing to mention about spiny dogfish, you know, we talked about the use of, or I talked about the use of absolute numbers as a mitigating factor. Now, um, FAO, um, there's an expert panel that met in early December and I was a member of that. We tried to um, estimate how many dogfish, spiny dogfish, there are in the world. Um, ballpark kind of back of the envelope calculation and we came up with for the recruited individuals slightly over a billion and whereas we couldn't decide whether 25 million sardines in a single school 
constituted you know, a mitigating factor. We thought a billion recruited individuals, you add the unrecruited, the, the small juveniles, you get up to at least one and a half billion. Um, we thought, you know, one and a half billion individuals spread um, throughout the temperate waters of the world was probably a mitigating factor against extinction. Um, but there are there there are some issues that go beyond just just the sort of the science um, at the upcoming Southeast meeting um, for bluefin tuna and actually some of the shark proposals, um, the oceanic sharks. Can society substitute for regional fisheries management organisations when these are not performing? So, bluefin tunas manage under the International Convention for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas, or ICAT. ICAT hasn't been doing a good job, and that's widely um, acknowledged. But they've tried really hard. And with the vertebra society system, they met last November and they reduced the quota down to 13,500 um, tonnes. Let me tell you what it was. 2006, this is the way ICAP has operated. So the scientists recommended a quota of eight for the Eastern Atlantic, 8,000 tonnes in order to rebuild the stock, 15,000 in order to um, ensure it wasn't going to be depleted anymore. The Commission set a quota of 30,000 tonnes and the actual catch was 61,000 tonnes. <laughs> so that's sort of the evidence for the lack of performance, but ICAP has been quite because I keep asking that ICAP, the member countries of ICAP are also the same people, same countries that are members of CITES. So, um, but the problem is that um, one of the roles of the RFMOs is to regulate the amount of fish taken out of the marine environment. CITES doesn't control that. All it controls is international trade. So it's a blunt instrument at best. So one of the big debates that's going to take place is um, should societies be a fisheries management authority? Can it be? Would it be better to just somehow light more of a fire under ICAP and get it to, or not ICAP, the ICAP member countries, get the ICAP member countries to be more responsible rather than relying on this sort of more blunt instrument? And I mentioned the fact that trade within the EU doesn't constitute international trade. That's an issue both for bluefin and, um, and for spiny dogfish. And then the issue that's sort of epitomised by spiny dog, which is taking maybe a couple of depleted, a, a species that has a couple of depleted stocks and listing all the rest as a lookalike. Pretty much every commercially exploited species in the world, maybe not every, but a huge proportion of all commercially exploited species will qualify if, um, if, this, um, if this happens and a precedent is made of it. So just my last um, my last couple of slides. So our uh, marine species are uh, marine species special, and um, and I'd say well yes in the sense that, and for the most part, intense exploitations only occurred in the last 50 or so years. Um, of course, that excludes a large number of, of very nearshore species where exploitations um, been going on at high levels for much longer. We do tend to have more data. Um, but actually, I think terrestrial systems have more data than what people realise as well, especially in terms of being able to infer what might have happened to, um, to this population size of various species. I think one important thing is that the ecosystems of which they are a part are generally still structurally and functionally intact. They're modified, but they're still functioning, as opposed to us Terrestrial systems where we've cleared land and put in farms and factories and, and towns and so forth. Um, there are still lots of populations or species with numbers in the millions of, or billions. And if you can't compare them to the species that sort of matter the most to us on terrestrial systems, um, the mammal, mammals, reptiles and birds, and they obviously have um, higher productivity. But I don't think they're that special. Um, and I actually think that Looking back at historical extended decline is a criterion that, that should be used for both marine, we are using it for marine, and fishery scientists have used it for marine species for a long time, but I think it should be used for terrestrial species as well. It actually set a higher standard for terrestrial species and result in more listings of terrestrial species on Pegnix 1. Um, and in both cases you need to, you'll probably need to use qualitative information or inference like those examples I showed of 99% of all of the 
eastern deciduous forests are gone or whatever. Well, if there are species that live there or are dependent on that, it's probably pretty reasonable to infer that there's probably a bit over 1% of those species left too. I mean, if they were fully dependent on it. There's certainly um, a lot you can do um, with, um, with inference and um, expert um, opinion on things. And I think similar historical set of decline criteria can actually be applied to both marine and terrestrial species, and they ought to be. If you read the, the FAO, uh, sorry, the site system criteria, the, um, the guidelines for listing marine species that are separated out in a totally artificial way, I believe. And part of the reason is because, in fact, people prefer not, many people prefer not to use quantitative criteria for, um, for site systems um, and marine fisheries. Scientists in general and marine scientists um, tend to quite like the idea of a standard that, that, that you know that um, maybe has a little bit more teeth to it. Thank you very much. Uh, questions, anyone, or, 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 or debate, or whatever. No questions? Everybody's totally in agreement? But <laughs> yes? I was wondering, this kind of relates to racism, but just in a more general sense, in terms of society, I was wondering if you could talk about pros and cons of using something like unfinished biomass as a reference um, for deciding whether something is overfished versus, uh, versus another type of reference point that maybe says something more about the life history of the species, um, given that. All right, well, I mean, you know, I agree with you about the life history, and, and so that's partly taken into account with using these different um, categories or bins relative to productivity. It's not much, you know, 5 to 10% for high productivity, 10 to 15 for medium, and 15 to 20 for low. Um, and, then, uh, and then sort of in some quite qualitative way, inserting modifying factors onto that. If you're talking about doing modeling like population viability analysis, um, that would be another way of looking at it. And my main issue with that is that you're trying to model the biology of species at population levels where the whole biology of the species may have changed. We don't know much about how it changes at low population levels. We can kind of know about all the effects that they might occur, but um, we haven't done the experiment too often where we've taken species to that level and monitored them as well. You know, we've accidentally taken them to those sorts of levels, but we've definitely not monitored them. I don't think we want to do that experiment very often. So, I mean, I think there is something for having more rule of thumb thresholds rather than trying to model, specifically model something dynamics that you don't actually know anything about. I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, you, you, your point is taken. You should take into account all the life history characteristics that you know of. And actually, one of the points I didn't make during my talk is that um, you have to consider things on a case-by-case -case basis. And you, I wouldn't suggest taking these these um, extent of decline guidelines like, okay, if it meets it, we'll list it. If, it's, if it meets it, we'll look at it through them and look at their life history characteristics and see which you know, whether that would lead us to be more or less concerned about that species. Yeah? Following up on that question a little bit, uh, I mean, you mentioned, you know, these kind of qualitative guidelines and modify factors. I was wondering if there was any, um, like, uncertainty factors. You know, you, in quantitative assessment, you can get, you know, some estimate of your uncertainty, and it seems like that could apply in the qualitative. Um, yeah, you certainly could. I mean, the, the thing about side east listings is that um, you've got the scientific aspects, you know, where to what extent has the stock declined, but then you've got a lot of other factors as well that come into it, like it only protects international trade or monitors international trade. So how, to what extent is it an international trade? Then you've got implementation issues. Um, in some cases, almost insurmountable implementation issues that have stopped some species from getting listed because it would be a waste of time and money because you wouldn't be able to implement it. Um, and then, in some cases, 
blistering on societies can potentially create perverse incentives, in other words, create a black market. And, you know, this has been a problem with some of the orchids, like the, you know, the orchid enthusiasts. Oh well, a new species listed on CITES, I don't have that one yet, I'm going to get it, you know. And um, so you talk about uncertainty and, and the science, I think the uncertainty in the science is actually just, you know, one aspect of it. And, you know, doing a PDA you certainly could have some uh, uncertainty. I think um, the approach that has been taken more is the weight of the evidence and the sort of expert judgment and so forth. I mean, that, does it qualify? Will it be effective? Is it an international trade? And is it implementable? And then, of course, on fisheries, is there a fisheries management authority that um, this is going to either help or maybe hinder? And um, can we kind of, um, you know, as I said, make the fisheries management authority more effective? And would that be a better way of doing things? Talking about the black market um, sites and species. In regards to um, eastern stuff of blue container, do you think the sightings sites are seeing could see that stuff from going on that they have black market if it is such a viable species? Oh, that, would that actually, yeah. No, that, that's a actually the nuances on the the blue um, If any of you have followed the media, or maybe you haven't. All of the um, what's gonna. This is a highly emotional and, and, and politicised, a, a really hot issue at the moment. So I don't know about a black market, but one of the problems with CITES and almost every other international fisheries organisation is that when they were set up, they put in a clause that allowed you to work extremely hard during the meetings to reach agreement, you know, staying up till three or four in the morning or whatever, getting every word, you know, so that all countries could sign on to it. And then after that, you've got 90 days to make a reservation which says, this thing I agreed to and worked so hard towards, I'm not going to do it. So, Japan and China and, um, and a number of other Asian countries have already said they're going to take out reservations, which means Japan is both a catching country and an importing country, but it takes about 80% of the worldwide catch, or, yeah, I think probably the whole worldwide catch of um, Atlanta Bluefin. Um, it's said, so it's it's basically said, we're going to take out a reservation, therefore we will buy and import it. Um, now, of course, they, they don't catch all that much, I think maybe less than 10%, maybe more like 5%. So they'd better, you know, put their own catch into their country, but if they'll get probably North African countries to, which do some farming or bluefin, to also take up reservations. So there'll be, you know, that'll be one way around it. Um, in terms of a black market, um, well, there's already quite a huge one, given the fact that the reported catch, uh, well, the reported catch was um, maybe two-thirds of sort of the estimated catch, so that already exists. And, ICAT has a catch documentation system and a catch tracking system. It's just that people don't use it. Now, CITES has one, and maybe there'll be more teeth in it, but that remains to be seen. Um, yeah, I think an appendix, an appendix one listing could do some good. It could cause huge rifts. There are already people like Japan who think that CITES should stay away from marine species, completely stay away from them, leave it up to the regional fisheries management organisations. <laughs> and they're taking that attitude this year. They're basically, they have said that they're going to take out reservations on all six of those proposals. Um, and some other countries will do the same thing. So, you know, it's, it's complex and it's, um, if you're interested in, um, in politics in particular, it's, it's really quite interesting. It's going to be a, a really interesting meeting. In fact, you know, if you have any interest at all in that, and, and um, whether conservation or politics wins the day, um, you know, I suggest you might want to follow the media once this meeting starts on the 13th, and especially as we head towards the 25th of March, which is the end of the meeting. Liz, I, I just wondered if you had any comments on the uh, on the other shark species. Yeah. Oh, um, well, I, I should have actually said this FAO ad hoc panel actually. Um, has recommended 
Yes, for an appendix two listing for poor people, and um, it does look to be in, in um, actually fairly poor shape in most parts of the world, though not all. Yes, for oceanic white tip. And as most of you probably know here, one of the big issues with sharks, especially the large sharks, is finning and, 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 and the fin market. And oceanic white tip is one of the, is a key product, uh, a, a key species that's targeted. The hammerheads are also quite key. So the panel recommend, and, and the, the populations have been really severely depleted in many parts of the world, so it was a yes for that. The dusky and sandbar is lookalikes. The case, unfortunately, was not very good for that, so uh, recommended against that, and um, recommended against spiny dogfish, and recommended against the corals um, being listed as well. Um, for Again, for reasons that it's the Mediterranean <coughs> where the species is heavily exploited and depleted, but not necessarily the rest of the world. And, you know, the sort of suggestion is that maybe the Mediterranean countries need to get their act together. And, um, you know, I, I mean, and there's no doubt that there's a need for better management in the rest of the world as well. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, a lot of people, uh, in fact, this is not the first time it's been tried, you know, it's to use the society system to try and get the um, RFMOs to work. It was tried with um, toothfish, so it was uh, a listing for toothfish was um, considered, and as a result, Kamala considered it. Convention for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources put in a catch documentation system. The proposal was withdrawn. It was, um, well, it was withdrawn at the meeting, I guess. And certainly there have been threats of that. There's been a big review, a major review of all of the regional fishery management organisations recently. And they're pretty much all underperforming. But you know, you say the, the regional management organisation is underperforming, it's actually done member states. That are not stepping up to the mark. And um, ICAP member states are amongst the worst of all. Uh, I think ICAP probably got rated, I'm not sure that they actually did a ranking, but it got one of the most scathing reports of all. But you know, they've reduced um, the quota down from 30,000 30, tons to 13,500 tons within a period of about two years which is pretty good. Um, now if they could just get their member nations to only catch that amount, that would actually be even better. Well, I think that we have a reception out there and I think Pamela will be happy to talk with people about more questions about studies and I want to thank them for again. This was very interesting, especially given the meeting coming up. We'll be watching it in the media. Thank you.